Martina och sagt om inte allt det till alla. Okay everybody. Good morning and most welcome here to Integrated Transport Research Lab or ITRL. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of having one of our Tuesday seminars. It's part of our seminar series where we invite speakers to talk about interesting trends in the transportation sector. Um, today we have the great pleasure of talking about the project Autopiloten, Sweden's first self-driving bus on public roads. And to do that is Peter Hoffmar from Nobina, Anna Pernestol from KTH, and also director here at ITRL, and also Esther Peche from KTH, who's a PhD researcher. So uh, this is part of our seminar series, as I said. Uh, next event will be the 27th of March, where Jenny Janhager and Liridona Sopiani will talk about KTH Mobility Pool. So the registration for that will open soon on our website. So please, after the seminar, you should be able to sign up for that as well. Um, just some practical information. We have uh, toilets downstairs, and we have some uh, breakfast there with sandwiches and coffee if you haven't got that. So you can take that afterwards, maybe. Um, there will be time for questions after the presentations, um, maybe during the presentation as well, that <laughs> you can decide. Uh, but otherwise, yes, let's get started and most welcome. Hi, is this on? Okay, great, great. No? no but we, we only use it for the, uh -huh. for the live stream. Ah, okay. So you can, <laughs> you can hear me back there. <laughs> good, good to know. Uh, uh, this is actually the wrong one. Well, doesn't matter. We'll uh, skip a few slides. <laughs> uh, uh, I sent the wrong uh, presentation to Anna, but uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But we'll take it as a go. Uh, my name is Peter Hafmar. I'm the MD for uh, Nobina Technology, uh, the innovation company for, for Nobina, who's uh, a public uh, transport operator in uh, Nordic countries. Uh, we are, I can briefly go through this then. Uh, we're 12,000 uh, employees. We um, drive approximately a million people on our buses on a daily basis, uh, which take us uh, 19 laps around the world. Uh, so that's Nobina. <laughs> I will skip this and knowledge so far. Uh, first, to start with, uh, how we got the approval. Uh, I know some in here uh, are in that loop uh, right now. Uh, it's, uh, it was a quite interesting uh, uh, period. It took us around about one and a half year altogether from start. Uh, and why did we do it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we thought that we can't just do trials on, on, on uh, closed roads. We have stopped learn new things with that. Uh, we people coming to a closed area did know what they ex uh, they ex uh, know what they expected, and they did understand that this is a safe haven. No other cars will be here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's short, very, very, very short distance, like a few hundred meters and so on. So we want to test it in real life. So we started to give a call to Transport uh, Styrelsen or the Swedish Transport Agency, asking how do we do this? We want to do it on, on public roads. And they say, we don't have a clue. Uh, so we started to do a lot of, of um, trials, different uh, uh, legislation, try with uh, different license plates, uh, different colors on the license plates. Um, and. Um, we went through that and we got uh, denial at every single location because we found areas where we couldn't uh, fulfill the requirements. For example, you have the Vienna Convention uh, where you have, a, I don't know, it's like 58 points that you, a vehicle need to fulfill. Uh, so we went through that uh, for at least a half a year trying to find new areas to go. And then uh, the new Bjelvestam uh, came with a new proposal of a new legislation and we said okay let's try that. So then we started with that and we found out that that doesn't help us too much because we still need to have a type approved vehicle in the, in the, in the from, from the scratch. So if we would go with a Volvo bus or a Scania bus that would have been easier. 
So uh, this vehicle that we are driving doesn't fit into a typical norm. It's not the M1 or N1 or whatever. So how do we do that? So then we had to go back to the Vienna Convention, go through all the list, describing the full system. And also when it's not a type approved vehicle, we need to go down to the security chain, explaining okay, what happened if uh, LIDAR stopped working, if you push the emergency stop brake, is it fail safe if you pu push one and that uh, is faulty, will the vehicle uh, keep on running uh, or has it already stopped? So we had to go through a, a mini type approval of a new vehicle. Uh, which took us uh, more about uh, like half a year uh, with a really good dialogue with uh, the Swedish Transport Agency. And I think that's one of the gains in Sweden that we have an open dialogue with, uh, with our agencies. And uh, uh, the Transport Agency did understand that these type of vehicles are manufactured of not traditional manufacturers that uh, work in, in the traditional way. Uh, so we went through the, the safety chains and they helped out all the time with the suppliers as well say okay this is uh, what we expect not what you should do but that this is what we expect the outcome not how you should do it so the dialogue was really good fr from uh, all, all time and I think um, uh, we continue to have that dialogue with uh, SD as well SD as well and I think that's one of the gains in, in Sweden that we can have an open and honest dialogue. And I think that could put us in a pole position moving forward. If we take these lessons moving forward, I think we can continue to have a pole position uh, and even go maybe in, in the forefront. I think we're le n uh, number four in, in the world right now in autonomous vehicles. I think we can go, go up to number one if we let ourselves. But when we then had explained everything regarding the safety chains and uh, the vehicles itself and uh, that it's not a bus, it's not a, a, a car, it's not a truck. Uh, uh, now it actually is a bus uh, because it's defined. It, need, it needed to be defined as something, so it was defined as a bus. Uh, but after that, uh, we need to uh, show that everything we said in documentation, that that was actually true in real life. So we went down to the test truck in France and we do, did all the tests that we said it could handle. And we passed that in a day. Uh, so it was very, very uh, straightforward. Uh, again, open and honest dialogue. When that was done, they said, okay, now you can set it up in real traffic. So we brought the vehicles to Shista and we set up the, the, the track. And why did we do it in that way and didn't get the approval after showing that it was safe? is because uh, we have the traffic rules in Sweden, how you as a person uh, should handle traffic. So if you take a right turn, you should go to the right in the, in the, in the road and then put on the blinkers and, and turn right. You should check your rear view, mirror, etc. etc. And um, we need to show that that we could do as well, and what risks could we, uh, could we see? If we take a left turn, what risk do we see, and how do we handle those risks? So we went through all this uh, documentation of what you should be able to handle and not in, in, um, in Swedish law of, of uh, driving a car. In, in, in. And um, one of the uh, best examples there in there is that in Sweden, you need to be able to ma uh, handle a, a policeman's sign. So if a policeman stopped uh, stop you, like that, the car should stop. But if the policeman do like that, then you should turn to your right, your right. Uh, and we said, okay, the vehicle don't understand human uh, signs, so we won't handle that. So that's why we have a, a, a person on board. Some of the legislation we can't handle today, we will hand handle them soon, but not yet. So. Then uh, when that was done, we the SDA came down to uh, Shista and we had a, a, a trial. So uh, upshining in Swedish. <laughs> uh, they actually went on the bus and said, yeah, but you're turning into the bus stop. You, you, you turn on the signal too late. Okay, so we re reprogrammed that and said, okay, now you're good. So it's really a, 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 an upshining. What's the English word? Anyone? No? 
driving test. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, we actually, after that, they said, okay, now you handle the traffic as you said, and with the safety driver on board, you're good to go. So um, we joked about, it, let's get a driver's license with a, with a bus on it. It would be nice. <laughs> Uh, so that's what's happening if we handle, uh, if we drive somewhere else now, we just need to explain the, the traffic si si situations and ma make a new driver's test and say that this is how we handle it, if it's new scenarios. If it's the same scenarios as in, in Chista, we just explain it and they can say, that's the same. But today we don't drive in a roundabout. If we want to do that, we need to show them this is how we do a roundabout. So 20th of December this uh, last year, we, we got the approval. First uh, vehicle in, in Swedish roads. And uh, I really hope that, and I know that uh, more vehicles will be on the roads very soon in, in Sweden, which is, is great because we need to have more tests in real life to be able to learn. So the 24th of January, we had the first official uh, uh, day of driving. Uh <coughs> and uh, it was, uh, we didn't uh, expect that uh, much uh, attention. Uh, we got uh, a load of, of attention. Uh, Orke from uh, Urban ICT is here and Anna is there as well. And uh, the attention was massive. Uh, we had journalists from, from Sweden and, and the rest of the world. Uh, and it continues to, to be a big focus from, from the rest of the world. Last week I was interviewed by uh, Japanese uh, television. Uh, so one can, s for me, I mean, we're driving a small bus in a, in a fairly short area. But internationally, I think Sweden has a reputation that we do things serious. And due to that, I think we got the uh, attention that we have got. Because if we believe that this is something we can do, I think the rest of the world look to that. A lot of due to, to Volvo and Scania and, and others that we have put ourselves on the map regarding vehicles and safety uh, and I think that's why the, the attention uh, exploded that uh, uh, we didn't expect and we didn't look for really it, we want to do the test so um, this test is uh, not just Nobina it's uh, a lot of, of companies and we believe that this is nothing we can solve ourselves uh, we of course need the vehicle manufacturers for the vehicle but so much more Klöven is, is uh, in this, and Klöven is a real estate owner. They own uh, uh, a lot of, of properties in, in Shista. Mm -hmm. And they, in this, they want to see, okay, what happens with property if you have quite a long distance to walk but from, from a bus stop? What happens if you have a shuttle traffic to these uh, uh, offices? What happens with the, with the dynamic of the, um, of the area? What happens with, with, with the value? SJ... Not too many people live by the train station. How can we get people in an easy way to, to, the, to the trains? Ericsson, uh, fairly uh, obvious, but uh, how do you connect uh, these vehicles and with everything else? A lot of qu question comes to, okay, do we need 5G? No, not right now. But as you know, uh, data streaming uh, and so on increases with uh, number of, of units and with traffic the number of units will explode and also when you start to uh, need to act with the vehicles to give them new commands you need to see what the vehicle sees then you need to have a short latency in the light to light scenario from your screen to what the what the vehicle sees uh, the city of stockholm is, is in this and of course that's about the infrastructure how would stockholm look like in the future if we have autonomous vehicles uh, urban ICT is a uh, uh, game breaker move now and moving forward I think it would be great if we could uh, use this even more to get real tests and um, test areas where you are not limited as much as you are in the rest of the of, the, um, of Sweden so have a, ha a safe haven for example the cameras Today, Anna won't will want to use cameras on the bus, but it takes us six months to get an approval. Could we get these kind of things to say, okay, Shista is, uh, uh, you're okay to use cameras, you're okay to use test vehicles, as long as you follow, you don't have to go through a one and a half year process to get it, or six month approval. 
so we can do the tests in real life because that's where we learn. Uh, and when you go in a test track, it's easy to see because uh, you know how the vehicle works. So you act to the vehicle because you know how it acts. So, uh, but in the real life, we've seen that now people uh, trying to stop the bus uh, after it left the, the bus sto stop, stop the bus and then jump on because they know that they can stop the bus. You don't stop it. You don't walk in front of a normal bus and try to stop it and jump on. But you can do that with the, with the autonomous vehicle. And we couldn't, we couldn't see that before. <laughs> we need to do tests and we need to do it in, in safe havens. And it would be great if that could be she's done. Anna will talk about uh, uh, ITRL's uh, uh, things in, in this uh, project. And I think uh, more research on this uh, and uh, faster and not better, <laughs> not better because we have the best. Uh, the test itself, you probably uh, know uh, most uh, uh, people here, but it's uh, two vehicles from uh, a manufacturer called Isama. It's a French uh, manufacturer. The vehicle uh, holds 12 passengers. It says 11 here because the uh, host on board is one of the 12. Uh, we can drive 20k. Right now we drive maximum 12 and that's due to the weather. If you look outside, it's, uh, it's not um, uh, the best weather. Uh, and we don't want to see any, any accidents and that's why we, we have it slower. So as soon as it gets a little bit more clear, then we will increase the speed. We drive each day uh, 7 to 6 and the track is around about 1500 meters. Uh, the vehicle itself, sorry, uh, the vehicle itself is uh, uh, steered by lidars. So that's the only autonomous system we have. It's uh, GPS positioning and LIDARs. We don't have object uh, identification yet, and we don't have uh, radar yet. Uh, uh, the route is pre-recorded, uh, as most of the vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles today, if you don't look at the white lines on the roads. So it we drive up and down where we want to drive, and we record it, and then you have all static objects and then all moving objects and then you do that several times and then you can wash away every moving object and just have the static objects and then you know the location and then you put that into your memory and when you drive if you have something moving then you know it's a new object. Uh, we can run in several modes we dri drive in a subway mode now so we stop it in each uh, position but you can have uh, bus mode so you press the stop button uh, so it stops, otherwise just continue to drive. Or you can have on, on demand. On demand we won't test with the public, uh, with the public uh, but we will do tests on our own. So you can say uh, this GPS position to that GPS position. So it comes and picks you up and, and go somewhere else. These buses, uh, it's important to say, that won't solve the long distance uh, scenario as, as um, Volvo and Scania will do later on. Uh, this is to find uh, the door-to-door -door solution for public transport because we believe that uh, we don't want to, a lot of question got from she says okay but it's just people walking and taking the bike in this area why why do you drive here uh, do you want people to walk less no not at all I want people to walk more but I want to have the people taking the car to work so they can come from their house to the subway or bus uh, to their office or from the bus stop to the office. So they can go for door for door in public transport because that's how we solve the, the situation moving forward. Uh, I will cover that a uh, little bit more later on. Uh, different sub projects. Anna will talk about the behavior study and, and customer interface la later on. Uh, but uh, the vehicle we, we run through, and that's super important. But the other systems are, if not more important, equally important. How do you operate? Uh, how do you know? How does no, uh, bus know where to drive and and to where? And when should it be on service? How do you service it? How do, you, uh, do it? Does it handle um, uh, other planning scenarios? Uh, how do you secure that it uses the right amount of vehicles in the uh, right time? Uh, 
you can do these tests uh, so with as we do today with with uh, drivers but we won't have the drivers the driver will be the computer so how do we secure that they act according to what we know and how do we give them the right s command in the right way with safety so we don't you can't hack it and drive it somewhere else uh, Traffic management, uh, cloud, I talked about Ericsson. And uh, then sit in an environment. How do we clean the roads of snow for snow uh, when we have autonomous vehicles? Is it the same as we have today? Uh, or is it different? How does uh, uh, the city uh, plan moving forward with parking lots and so on and so, on and so forth? A lot of other things. This slide is, is uh, a little bit old, so <laughs> uh, due to my mistake. Uh, we have more than 6,000 6, people uh, now, and uh, average about uh, 240 people running per day, I think. We've been driving uh, 1,000 K up to a few days ago. Uh, we have had more than three shorter breaks because uh, last week it was uh, a lot of snow. <laughs> uh, it handles snow really well. Uh, when it comes to dump from the above of snow, then uh, it's more tricky. Uh, and we, due to security, we, we don't drive then. Uh, I think that's um, it. We can take questions uh, later on. Now we are doing the systems. Yes, great. Uh, <coughs> so um, let's talk about uh, uh, more more about the research and the learnings that we can do from the project. Um, we found, uh, we call this part of the project SARA 1. Uh, someone may, might have had a glass of red wine figuring <laughs> out this uh, title. But I think it's important, as, uh, all, as also Peter stressed, it is about research and understanding, uh, understanding the impacts of such services and understanding how users accept and behave around the, p around the vehicle and in relation to the service. But it's also, this one actually uh, has, a, uh, has a meaning, because yes, it is a first pilot, but we also expect <laughs> more pilots to come and more tests to come. So the testing is really important. Um, so what can we, uh, <coughs> what, what <laughs> can we learn from the, the project? Uh, we will uh, um, uh, assess this first pilot like here and now. What do the people that are on the streets uh, and that live and work in the area think about the service? Uh, how do they, uh, how do they, what do you think about being on the, uh, on the vehicle? But we will also collect uh, knowledge that can be used in the future. So it's not only about understanding this service. Okay, it is cool, it's the first one. Uh, but it is still only one and a half kilometers, so it's not super cool. Uh, but it is really cool because we can learn so much from it that we can think about, okay, what if we scale this up? What if we try this on another place? And this knowledge we would never ever have gained by only sitting here at our desks and thinking. Uh, for example, this brilliant example uh, that Peter told us about, uh, with the people stopping the bus. I think that's super clever, uh, stopping the bus. How many, uh, how many times have you, haven't you like, chased the bus and, and the driver looks like, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> um, so we can collect, uh, we, we create a knowledge base both about how do the vehicle behave in this scenario and what do the people think in this setting. Um, but we can also use the, this knowledge to scale up and do simulations using the simulation <laughs> tools that we have here at KTH. Um, we are also <coughs> using this, uh, this test to, um, to validate other methods. 
for example, we have already, <laughs> when Peter was working with getting the permission to drive on the streets, uh, we already started to do experiments with people meeting, um, meeting self-driving buses like this, but as we didn't have any buses, we created the world in VR instead and let people meet the buses in VR. Now, when we have the buses, we would like to, to test and see the experience from VR. Is that uh, the same or similar or similar enough as the experience in real life? Because if it is, uh, then it's much easier to test, uh, to test in the future and we can speed up testing and prototyping of uh, communication interfaces, etc. So that's also an important thing that we can learn as the vehicles drive on, on real streets in, in real <laughs> public environments. We, we're also thinking about, okay, how should this vehicle fit into a greater system? Uh, what if there were other vehicles on the streets? Um, uh, what if it should not be a safety driver on board anymore? Uh, but if the safety driver should be located some kilometers away and maybe handle a fleet of uh, 30 vehicles or even more, uh, how should that look like? So we can gain experience from this small example to learn about those other aspects as well. <coughs> okay, so, so looking at uh, here, here, looking at the questions that we study <coughs> in this project, we're talking about the, the uh, autonomous vehicle and the behavior of people. Uh, how do, uh, what types of uh, interactions between the vehicle and the users on board, but also around, and not only like pedestrians, but also cyclists, we know the taxi drivers. Uh, in Shista, they don't always follow the rules. Um, that's interesting. From a, it's it's a pain for uh, Mobina, but it's uh, interesting for us at KTH. Um, how do the how do the vehicle behave in different types of interactions? Uh, imagine yourself crossing a street, and the and the vehicle comes. Most of us actually react very heavily on um, the speed of the vehicle. That's, uh, that signalizes, uh, okay, what the vehicle want to do, uh, if it's going to brake or not, or if it's going to stop for us. So uh, how, sh how do the vehicle behave? How do the people behave and how do the vehicle behave? And maybe we could <coughs> change the behavior of the vehicle to make the traffic flow more smooth. Um, and this VR study, uh, so that's about the vehicle and behavior. We also study the service. That's, an, that's a higher level. What type of service do the vehicle actually provide? Does it work with this first last mile idea that we have? Or is it something else? Maybe only, tr only carrying visitors with heavy luggage. I don't know. We, we don't know yet. But what type of service? Um, and how can, how can the current public transportation network be supported by this type of service? Now we're trying it in Shista, but there are several other places around uh, in Stockholm and yeah, everywhere where this type of first last mile service could be useful. Uh, and finally, this, the question about the uh, autonomous vehicles and the system. Um, uh, what are this? I think this is also important. What are the system level impacts? Do people leave their car uh, or do they walk less? Will we decrease the CO2 emissions or will we increase health, uh, health costs with more people on the hospitals because, yeah, you <coughs> know, sitting is the new smoking? Um, so the, 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 the methods that we use to collect, collect data, of course, a lot of interviews. We're, uh, we're having a large interview, uh, interview efforts with uh, Esther will, will tell us soon 
the first preliminary result from the first wave of the interviews, we will follow several hundred of people during the six month long tri uh, trial. We also talk with people on board and, and on the vehicles. To track interaction and, and movements, yes, we, we had the first idea we can use cameras. That would be fun, nice. Not to, to see who the people are, but to see how the people behave. Uh, but uh, yeah, it would take the, the trial is six months, and it would take at least six months to get the, the permission to use the camera. So mm, probably, <laughs> probably not a good idea anymore. Uh, instead, we aim to use lidar sensors because then we can see people as moving objects, uh, and we can uh, see how fast and how they behave around the vehicle. And of course, we'll use vehicle data uh, like speed, energy consumption, etc. Yes, and with that, I'm super glad to uh, present Esther, a PhD student working in a project, yeah. presenting the first, uh, first preliminary results. Um, yeah, we collected 524 responses from the first round of questionnaire. So the respondents are those who live, work, or study in or around Hellenun and Shista Science City. So like, uh, firstly, let's take a look at, so what are the things like the respondents most concerned about when it comes to choosing between autonomous bus ride and the normal bus ride? So like out of the list of service attributes uh, asked in the questionnaire, this comes uh, to be the top five concerns that the respondents are care about when making such decision. So the first one is actually the safety of the onboard passenger and followed by the safety of the uh, road users in the surrounding of the autonomous bus. And then the punctuality of the service and availability of the information on unplanned changes due to vehicle breakdown and also traffic jam. And lastly is the freedom from crime. So as you can see, this, um, I mean like those uh, which are in blue are related to the safety aspect of the autonomous bus. And the rest are about the reliability in delivering the service, like the frequency and then uh, will it come on time and so on. So like secondly, let's look at the uh, the respondent's willingness to use the autonomous bus service. So 46.6% of the respondents expressed that they would probably use the service if it's available in the area where they live, work and study. And most of the respondents uh, would like to use the service two times per day and then one to three days per week. And most of the respondents, like 72.5% of the respondents, would like to use the service uh, for all seasons. But an interesting finding is actually like out of all the seasons, summer received like the relatively lower responses. Yeah, not a relatively like low, lowest number of responses. So yeah, maybe, I mean, this is something that we can look into. And um, yes, the respondents would like to use the service for work trip, followed by recreational trip and also shopping trip. Now we look at like how much more like the respondent would like to pay on top of the monthly travel fare, fare they are paying right now for like different kind of autonomous bus service. So the first kind of service is a personalized one. That means that you have the option to choose your boarding point and also the alighting point and without sharing the bus ride with other people. And most importantly, like the waiting time is less than three minutes. So for this kind of service, the respondents um, express that they are willing to pay around 150 krona to 200 krona on top of the monthly travel fare they are paying right now to have access to this kind of service. 
So the second type of service is a shared service, meaning that you still have the option to choose your boarding point and alighting point, but you have to share the ride with other people. Still, the waiting time is less than three minutes. So the respondent expressed that they will let uh they will they are willing to pay slightly less than one hundred krona on top of the monthly travel fare they are paying right now. And thirdly, it's also the same kind of shared service, but with the waiting time more than three minutes. So for this kind of service, the respondents are willing to pay slightly more than 50 krona like, to have access to the service. So all in all, these are just the prelimi uh, prelimi uh, preliminary findings we obtained from the first round of questionnaire. There will be two more rounds of questionnaire coming on in end of March and also in June. So, um, but if you, uh, like, like moving on, if you wish to know more and read more about the finding, you are always welcome to refer to the publication which will be uploaded on the uh, autoplotin website. <laughs> yes. So now I'll let Anna to take over the presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Esther. And uh, I really do look forward to uh, follow the following uh, following interviews here and see the development, perhaps, of the uh, uh, acceptance of the service. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's look, now we have looked what we are doing and we have started to do things, although the, uh, the premiere of the service, the, the kickoff of the service was just in, in the end of January, we have already started to gain some results. Um, so if we look uh, if we look out a little bit more, okay, what what do we see? What do we see in the future? And I think it's it's important to understand that looking into the looking into the literature uh, on the impacts and effects of self-driving vehicles, it is it, we it is very. It's, it is very different how, what simulations expect from the, from the vehicles. For example, uh, you can ask, okay, imagine if there were self-driving vehicles without sa safety drivers on board uh, that could be self-driving all around the place. Uh, that could go from wherever you want them to go to wherever you want, yeah, wherever you want to go. Uh, what will happen with the traffic? Most of us have seen pictures and film. Yes, the parking demand will reduce. Be, uh, we will need maybe 10% of the parking places. That's not true because it will be something between 50 and 80% of the parking places. But uh, anyway, um, we could probably reduce parking places. But uh, what will happen with the kilometers traveled by the vehicles? And here we see that uh, for example, in, in this report, they studied the, uh, the impact of vehicle kilometers. And if we use uh, auto uh, automated taxis, self-driving taxis that could take us wherever we want to go, yes, a reduction of the fleet with uh, uh, 90%, we need 10% of the fleet, but the kilometers traveled with the same travel demand as we have today will almost double. That means twice as much vehicles on the streets uh, as it is today. Not parked, but running. And this is doubled energy consumption, which is uh, yeah, <laughs> doubled CO2 emissions. Uh, even if we electrified vehicles, it's still doubled energy consumption. But if we can use shared taxis or this type of buses, together with high capacity public transport, uh, we can yeah, at least stay at the same level as today. In this case, in this, uh, in this case uh, the researchers, the simulation, they replaced <laughs> buses um, and only kept rails, um, um, commuting trains and metro. And then we could keep at the same level, w but with an improved service maybe. So this is really an inspiration saying that 
it is important if we would like to create a sustainable transportation system uh, we need to use the high capacity public transport in combination with this new service and to do that we need to understand uh, what do the people think about such a service how would they use it we need to collect all the information from this project to design systems that that work and that we like and would like to have um, I, I would also like to say that in the literature this challenge of last mile services and how this the small vehicles can complement public transport is not almost not studied at all uh, so it's super interesting example um, although <laughs> one can question it is it is a tiny tiny this is Stockholm where we would like to uh, where we would like to uh, like employ the, this nice service and we are studying a small it, it I tried to write uh, like paint it on, on the map but it was only like a point uh, so yes it is a small study but we gain very much information about how to scale it up and we can use simulations to see <laughs> how it would work in uh, in a greater context what do you mean by a small point yeah it's 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 here the the, the track we are, we're only Shista, we are in Shista here and we are traveling okay. one and a half kilometer around here and it looks kind of okay. tiny compared to whole Stockholm yes but still even if it is even if it is a toy example we can learn very much about how the users behave how the service behave and we will learn things that we would never ever have gained otherwise yes so here is a, a web page where we will upload uh, more knowledge and results as, as we gain them um, and with that uh, yeah I will close this part and you will continue with some outlook yeah. what do you let Nobina say for the future Ex what we expect uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Shocking enough, uh, I, I see more or less the same thing. Uh, there's a film uh, done by Dry Sweden, which is great. If you haven't seen it, Google it, and it's a film on the with the Swedish candies, uh, Algens Bila, driving around. And that picture is what autonomous cars is about. And that's the picture where what people paint when in general. It's a super bright future. We have no cars and it picks you up everywhere and drives you everywhere. And you have uh, uh, trees and cinemas and, and so on and so forth. And, and that could be it. It's a great future and I hope that will be the future. Uh, so we won't have time to uh, check the film now, but Google it if you haven't seen it. It's great. And if we can reach that, that's super. But we need to make an effort. Because otherwise, if we don't make an effort and we don't take the wrong decisions, Anna talked about it, but the, big, uh, the numbers you saw with 200% was shared, was shared taxes. So if you go autonomous and you have your own car as today, it's not 200%. This is Essingler uh, uh, here in Sweden. This is uh, uh, in Turkey, in uh, Istanbul. And that's the traffic today. Imagine if you go autonomous and you have your private car, then you will take your car to your work, might park it, or you will send it home to pick up your, uh, your kids. Uh, that will be uh, one drive without a person. There is no 200%, and it's 400%. I don't have the number, but it's massive. The, the increase, you will stand still, you will walk uh, faster because the, there will be a parking lot on the, on the streets. So that's the future. If you don't secure that we take the right decision, both when it comes to us as operators and car manufacturers, but the, the cities and, and countries need to take this serious because autonomous vehicles won't solve the solu uh, situation. The situation will be solved that we change behaviors. 
And that's what I think is the great thing with what, what Anna and, and, and uh, Esther and the team is doing. What can we do to change behavior and how can we move that forward? So if the future is smart, then we will solve, solve this. And that's why we are doing this. We, won't, we don't want to, to stop uh, people walking and so on. We want to find solutions that we share, uh, share public transport. So you can have the, the flexibility in, as in a car, but you travel, but you need to travel. You won't be able to travel on your own. Then we won't solve the, the environment, the, the city uh, situation and so on and so forth. So after Shistana, we will expand this, this test in, in uh, hopefully somewhere else, or the plan is to do it somewhere else here in Stockholm, that we will connect it, really connect it to the, the uh, public transport um, scenario. So we'll connect it with other buses, with other train stations and so on, in, in, in full, full on. With more vehicles, we'll go uh, from six to eight vehicles in one, typical area so you also have the frequency of these uh, shuttle services because you need to have three minutes waiting time or something like that so we need to increase uh, the, s the speed of the service but also uh, the convenience and when we connect that then we can do a lot of more research because then you really see the connection <laughs> to the two so that's what we, we hope, and then we, we have a few other tests around, around Nordic countries that we're, we are planning. So we believe that this is just the start, and we need to do it together with the, with the cities and, and the countries and other companies. Thank you. E eager question. Yes. <laughs> Wondering, are you going to use the same algorithms and comp components uh, with the result tests? No, we, we, uh, uh, the good thing is that we have a very good di dialogue with uh, SDA, as, as mentioned. So what we are able to do now, uh, especially in Shista, but uh, hopefully other places as well later on, is that we will, when we have new updates in the software, we will just send that into the SDA and explain this is what we do, and this is the risk analysis on that, and then we will get an update on it, hopefully. Cool. Of course, with the uh, uh, approval process, but uh, it will be shorter. Yes, uh, very interesting. Uh, I wonder if it would be interesting to test this in, in a totally different context, for example, with dedicated lanes. Because then you would not have many of the problems that you described here. And this is an issue in many countries, like in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico. You already have the BRT system. And in Sweden, the concept of the bus is very much like you take a bus in loops, then you end up in Hammarby after slinging around uh. in the whole city. And that, of course, is much more complex. While if you have a dedicated lane, you actually could it's a different type of problem, it's mass transport, but maybe that's uh, also a very interesting uh, concept to, to explore. It's super interesting and, and we do those research as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we have other parts in, in, uh, that uh, look into total infrastructure. How do you approve the, the speed of public transport? Uh, and uh, you have tests uh, other places in, in the world regarding autonomous uh, vehicles in, in, uh, in closed uh, roads, BRT-like. Uh, you have uh, to get there is a company that uh, uh, have the solution running in, in, in Holland. They've been running since the 90s, uh, autonomous, in close. So they are, that's a, then you have an easier solution autonomous and you will increase the speed. So I think that would be Super, but then you need to have the cities also uh, approving this and understanding that. And then you also have, you won't have the investment uh, as you need for, for um, trams today. You don't need a rail and so on and so forth. Exactly. So uh, I, I fully agree. Are doing something like that? Because we have had a project with the city of Curitiba in Brazil for some years and we are going to go for a next step. And we have tested the electric buses in, in the first phase. <laughs> And now it would be an opportunity also to look at other uh, mm. issues. Uh, it would be interesting. Do you operate in Brazil? 
No, we don't operate in Brazil. We are operating in Nordic countries. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we are looking into that in, in uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, how we can test that in, in, in real life, and hopefully soon. I have a question regarding uh, these weather problems. Uh, because one of the reasons for taking this type of vehicle might be that you don't like the weather that you have that day. How are you handling that? Very good question. Uh, surprisingly well, we, we just, as I mentioned, we just use uh, LIDARs right now. Uh, if you add on uh, rod radar and uh, object identification, then you will handle the weather better. Hopefully we'll add that in soon. Uh, but surprisingly uh, well handling of the weather and as you see outside it's uh, it's uh, problematic so the one of the biggest issues actually what Anna mentioned is is other vehicles that doesn't follow legislation taxis that are parking all over the place because we don't overtake right now because we have uh, uh, opposite traffic so but is that's more it's the snow from above not on the ground, yeah. And not snow on the ground. Nope. Uh, so uh, we handle uh, snow on the ground is not a problem. Um, it is when it snows a lot. When it snows a little bit, that's not a problem. Uh, but when it snows a lot, and uh, then uh, you have other technical solutions to that we we want to test um, fairly soon. But there are other technical solutions that could complement the LIDARs and yeah, gain advantages in, in the heavy snow. Yes. Good, uh, good, good question. <laughs> okay, more uh, questions. Your question is about, it's about the, the last mile solution. Uh, what are the main limitations uh, to extend it to the ordinary operations? Uh, like not just last mile, but mm -hmm. uh, longer route. Do you want to answer or should I? I, I, I can, one, uh, one answer is, uh, do we want to extend it to normal operations? Uh, because last my <coughs> one challenge with the, uh, if we take the, the hypothesis, high, co high capacity com uh, public transport operates fairly good, uh, at least if it's not snowing. Um, so one idea is to have this, this type of service, this type of small vehicles, just as a complement to the public transport and do the, that's the task of it, the first last mile services. But then it could maybe be another service, as uh, Smith has talked about here, with the BRT lines that are <coughs> more high capacity public transport that would probably benefit for, from uh, dedicated lanes. So I think the, the autonomous vehicles gives us a new uh, like a new component in the public transport system with new characteristics. Uh, today, the driver cost, the, the size of the bus, I, I can ask Peter here, is kind of decided by the, uh, it, sh it should be, it, it can't be too long because it has to fit into the city and move around, but it can't be too small either because we have, a, have a, an expensive driver aboard. But the autonomous vehicles could could then provide a new component in the public transport system. So I think the new technology, and we see that <coughs> all over the place, it's not finding like one solution that fits everywhere, but specializing <coughs> and do uh, that one solution, I would say, that fits quite good everywhere. But instead, find more different solutions that are excellent in the, their own habitats, <laughs> so to say, or in their own tasks. Oh, uh, totally agree. Um, I'm interested in many things, but one thing is uh, the evaluation. <coughs> um, did that include, or are you planning to include, why uh, the people in Chista use the bus? To my experience, when I was there about an hour, I say almost no one. I think there was one person who happened to see the vehicle that used it because it needed it. All other were using it for fun. That's a very good comment, and that's one of the problems we, we have seen so far. We didn't expect that uh, it was uh, a tourist attraction. 
uh, <laughs> uh, we want to come to that scenario. We know that there are people that use it on, on a daily basis. Have you counted them? No, not yet. All of my yeah, Esther, yeah, Esther yeah, might yeah. Uh, able to. That's why, like, um, we we plan to have like three round of like so called you can say observation and also like the fashion air and so on. Um, yeah, right now that is right because it seems like right now it's something new and everybody is so excited about it and yeah they try to you know like do I mean like yeah that's why right now um. <laughs> um, like we will we will say like this is how it is. But moving on, we want to find out what is the like the irregular behavior of people in response to this kind of service and so on. So um yeah. So we will see that how it goes in in the coming uh, round of observation and also the uh, question and so on. Uh, are you also looking at research or, or planning projects on uh, flexible routes and demand driven and how it can be co scheduled or aligned with the timetables and so on with public transports? I know that there's some research here at KPH that you know deals with that. Yeah, you, I think you give the, the answer. Yes, we have a dialogue in the within the project to see okay, what could we do on this one and a half kilometer long route or could we maybe extend the route a little bit and, and test more on demand services. Uh, but we start with uh, like <laughs> managing doing the, the regular services. Mm. And yes, of course, we do want to incorporate this on demand services. Yeah. Uh, for example, one, one way of doing it is that the autopilotum project is also part of the test site Stockholm project or, or that we are also running here at Aktaren where other projects <coughs> look at this type of services and yes. I just, I just think that uh, when you try flexible routes and demand mm. driven then basically the arrival times are you know a bit difficult to estimate and then align basically public transport to that might be a real challenge mm. yeah. but it could be a real benefit mm. in terms of service. Yes. But um, we we'll take this step first, and those are the coming steps. How, how do you do on demand, and in what area, and how do you secure that you have a vehicle in in the right time? Because I really like your question earlier. Um, uh, do we get a reoccurrence of people using it? Right now, I would say I guess it's very low because of the speed of the vehicle as well. When we increase the speed and also drive the full length to the, the train station then people will do uh, okay come out of the of the um, uh, train jump on the bus because it's there or wait uh, two or three minutes because they will save f save 15 minutes uh, uh, walking mm -hmm. then i think uh, uh, it will be used in, in, a, in a different way yes it is really i'm sorry Stefan. Uh, it, it is really time to uh, to finish this seminar now so i think we, we make the formal closing <coughs> You have a few mistakes. Yes. Uh, so, yes. So now we, we formally close the seminar uh, as we are five minutes over time. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you.